Here's how I made $100,000 in under 10 minutes. So you spent $150,000 on this Porsche. Why are you wasting your money like that? I'm not actively working for that income. I only work about 30 minutes to an hour per week just to manage everything. You should be able to save an extra 10 to 15%. You can get 10% off on your trading. First thing I did. No, 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 no. What the hell are you doing? I'm lying about making money. Dan, if so. you want to make a finance TikTok, you're going to have to pump up your numbers. But these are pretty big. Pump them. If I made 400 grand a year, I would be embarrassed. You're going to have $3,145,000 invested. Everything I do with my stocks of portfolio and trading portfolio. Cut. What was the problem that time? Fundamentals is too inside baseball. So is stock. Those are like basic finance terms. Try these lines I wrote. When green line go up, good. Green line only go up. Money, 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 money. Jay-Z, Bugatti. I think I truly came to terms with something that we aren't supposed to admit in society. And God forbid, if you're an adult, <laughs> you are not supposed to admit this. Whilst researching for today's video, I feel like I truly was able to understand just how financially illiterate I am. And I think a large percentage of the population isn't as financially educated as we should be. And I think that's partly by design. I feel like, again, I'm, I'm a little bit embarrassed to admit that, but I think you guys know this isn't a finance YouTube channel. I've made one video about how I got my financial sh together at the age of 30. I'll have that linked if you want to check it out. And I think the only other financial advice I've given here in my time was that you should consider buying your things from Sephora while they're on sale. That is the extent of my financial advice on YouTube. Until now, we are talking about the scammy world of finance bros. The more videos that I watched by these finance bros, these finfluencers, I started to feel like my lack of education, my lack of understanding of the topics that they were sharing was something that a lot of, I think, finance bros and finfluencers used to their advantage. The flashy cars, the nice watches, the logos, the labels, being surrounded by beautiful women, living in these mansions, traveling on private jets, or just traveling regularly to these exotic luxurious destinations. I think that a lot of finance bros, finfluencers, use this to their advantage. It's all part of the business model to reel in young boys and young men to potentially get a taste of this lifestyle and the lifestyle in which having their type of money can offer them. Today's video, I wanted to talk about the main issues that I personally have with finance bros and finfluencers. Of course, feel the need to say, I don't have a problem with all of them. I don't believe that they're all bad, but I do wanna talk about some of the main issues I have with a, a large number of them and some of the shady things that they have been involved in. Probably the main issue that I have with these finance bros, and I think it's something that a lot of people tend to forget whilst watching and whilst indulging in this kind of content. These finance bros are influencers first and financial advisors, I guess you could say second, or sometimes not even at all. At the end of the day, these finance bros, these finfluencers, they're influencers. Their main priority is themselves, their platform, and whatever is going to grow them a bigger platform, a bigger community, and in turn, more money. Their main priority is building themselves a larger audience. Increasing their platform means increasing their net worth and their lifestyle. If you work with, say, a financial advisor or a stockbroker, they have a little bit more of a one-on-one -on -one relationship with you. You are a priority to some degree. Whereas when a lot of people join these communities with these influencers, hundreds of thousands of subscribers or even millions of subscribers, they are just one little drop in this giant ocean and their individual needs matter less. If you are one subscriber in a sea of a million and you are turning to a finance influencer for help or for advice, your needs and your goals matter less. You're just a number. Whereas if you're working more one-on-one -on -one with a professional, you tend to get a little bit more personalized advice. We know that lifestyle influencers are able to portray a dream life on social media and Finfluencers, finance bros are no different. Finance bros are able to also portray and create this dream aspirational life on social media that sometimes 
is far away from the life they actually live. Tyson is somebody that I talked about in a semi-recent video about influencers who are secretly broke. I'm gonna have that video linked if you wanna check it out, but I did bring him up at the end of the video because he was experiencing some financial trouble. Is he broke? Honestly, I don't really know. Instagram, the world of social media is an illusion and it's a strange place. People can claim they're one thing, but then be completely opposite or portray a life they look like they're wealthy, but then maybe they're not. I don't know this man's finances. I don't know how well he does. A woman by the name of Miriam Robin from Financial Review did an article about Tyson as recently as March of this year, which I will be taking some excerpts from. In the video that I have linked down below, I talked briefly about Tyson who was actually forced into bankruptcy because in a nutshell, he was essentially operating a financial services business without the proper financial services license. As of now, from what I've read, he is actually banned from doing this type of business in Australia, which is potentially one of the largest reasons why he is now currently residing in Dubai. At the time when Tyson was in the midst of his troubles, he was globetrotting, he was living around the world, living lavishly, the high life, but apparently he was miserable. At least that's what he used to say, though not to those that he was trying to sell his stock trading courses to. Back in May, 2023, in emails captured in court documents that were part of the regulators now concluded bankruptcy case against him, he said, I am currently residing overseas as I have currently been unemployed for the last 18 months. He wrote to cause partner Anna Ross, who was representing ASIC. Additionally, despite my best efforts on social media to portray positivity, I have been going through some serious deteriorating mental health issues, coupled with my recent relationship stress. Tyson has forever portrayed a lavish lifestyle on social media with a lot of now deleted photos because he has actually started a whole nother Instagram account for his new ventures in Dubai. But back then, his content was very similar to the kind of content he posts now. And this was when he was going through his legal troubles, his apparent unemployment and his mental health issues and his misery. He was portraying a life on social media that was allegedly far from what he was experiencing. And allegedly at the time, he did not have the funds that ASIC demanded. He had proposed three monthly payments of $25,000 each, this being the best that he could offer at the time, since he said that he hadn't made any income in months and the global economy had turned for the worse. ASIC denied this offer, probably as well partly because at the time he was again posting his lavish life. He was posting travels of him to Santorini and other various luxurious locations. So they then proceeded to bankrupt him for over $436,000 in legal costs. In February, 2023, around the same time, he actually also sold his $4.6 million Gold Coast mansion. And at the time he did sell it for slightly more than what he paid for it. However, it is believed that he actually made a loss on this particular mansion because of the unbelievably high interest rates that he had to pay. It also later came out that a lot of his luxury cars, his, his sports cars, his Ferraris, his Lambos that he was seen driving around in, were also rented. This issue a few years ago that he'd been through was not his first rodeo with legal troubles or being unable to afford his lifestyle. Back in 2019, he actually sent opposing lawyers a copy of his Centrelink benefits to argue that he was unable to meet a $760,000 debt that he apparently owed his mother. And keep in mind, this was days before he posted a photo of himself boarding a 76 foot yacht and drawing attention to the $5,000 fuel bill of his day out on the yacht. This man that has all of these luxurious flexing photos on social media was apparently being supported by Centrelink payments, but still being able to afford a day out on a 76 foot yacht in the Gold Coast, whilst also being in a legal battle with your own mother. Like it just sounds so messy. The man also claims he's self-made. I don't know if I believe that. He is known to be a compulsive liar. Marketing yourself as self-made when you potentially aren't is again, I think one of the best ways to market yourself as a finance bro, because people trust you, people look up to you, people aspire to be like you. Because if you claim that you're self-made and you already didn't have certain privileges or certain backings, financially, 
it's a lot easier for everyday individuals to be able to relate to you and buy what you're selling if they believe that you all started on an equal footing. I think it's a lot easier for Tyson to sell these $600 trading courses if he continues this narrative of I'm a self-made man. Going back to the case with his mother, the lawyers actually filed a transcript of a conversation with Tyson, which included claims about the Lamborghini, the rented cars. He said, quote, it's not my car, it's for marketing. I pay $1,500 a week to sell courses, he allegedly said. I have expensive taste. I will go to dinner most nights. I spend a lot of money on that. Clothes, it's pretty significant because that's what social media is about. I have to keep maintaining a lifestyle for the image for the selling. He allegedly threatened to drain from his bank account $150,000 he was offering his mother and then sit on the stand and happily say, I've got no money. When he was actually asked about this conversation, he initially disputed the conversation's accuracy. However, it was pointed out to him that the filing was a verbatim transcript and he maintained he was vulnerable and quote, going to say anything at the time. He said he might have said what was listed, but the lawyer should not have taken it literally. These are the type of characteristics some finance bros hold. Now, this is the last thing I want to say about Tyson before we move on from this, but I'm going to also take a wild guess that his Instagram following is also fake and it's also a facade and he bought his followers. I don't believe they're genuine because the ratio just smells iffy to me. Check their follower ratio to how many likes or comments they receive and you can smell a phony a mile away. First of all, he has over 100,000 followers on Instagram, but he's hidden his likes. You can't see his likes, which to me is a big red flag. Now for someone who posts these lavish photos, wealthy photos, these real jaw dropping, flexing photos, I don't know. I personally follow people and I know of people on Instagram who have like 200 followers who have more engagement than that. It just doesn't seem right that out of 100,000 people, you would only get like four or five comments. It just doesn't add up to me. Maybe if he took a lot of time off, maybe, you know, the algorithm buried him, but for somebody who posts as often as he does, he really doesn't get the engagement that a lot of accounts with a genuine following of 100,000 people receive. The second issue that I take with a lot of these finance bros and finfluencers is that they sometimes aren't actually properly trained or properly educated, or in the case of Tyson, don't actually hold the proper licensing. Now, going back to being properly trained or properly educated, is that always a bad thing? Not necessarily. However, I do think in the case of taking advice from somebody regarding your finances, I don't think I would really want to take somebody's advice so closely who is not trained, educated, or even holding proper licensing to be able to advise me on my finances. A lot of these finance influencers who talk about certain stocks or certain trades are usually just going off hunches and patterns. And sometimes to me, it just feels like a bit too much of a gamble. I don't believe in astrology. If I wanted to see a star, I'd look in the mirror. I let the stocks decide my mood. <laughs> Damn it. Wait, is green good? Green's good. I think that they can make mistakes just like anyone else and the market can be quite unpredictable. Anything can happen. Chris Sane is the next finance bro that I want to just briefly take a look at in today's video. Chris Sane posts almost daily videos on the stock market, various investments, trades, things like that. I do want to take a moment to go over his qualifications on his website and what his bio states about him on his website. It says here, Chris's journey. I was a former division one athlete who accumulated a massive amount of credit card and student loan debt. I was a walk on, so I didn't have the same financial resources as other athletes, but I had something even more valuable, a strong work ethic and a never give up attitude. I grew up in the inner city and I saw firsthand how poverty and lack of opportunity can hold people back. I knew that I didn't want to be a statistic. I wanted to create a better life for myself and my family. So I worked hard, I studied hard and I never gave up on my dreams. It wasn't easy. There were setbacks and challenges along the way, but I never gave up. I knew that if I kept working hard, I would eventually achieve my goals. And I did. I graduated from college, earned advanced degrees and became a successful entrepreneur. I also paid off my debt and became a best-selling author and speaker. I'm not sharing my story to brag. I'm sharing it to inspire you. If I can do it, you can do it too. No matter where you come from or what challenges you face, you can achieve your dreams if you never give up. I believe in you, Chris. Now, 
I do want to take a second to say that sounds beautifully inspirational and very motivating and it sounds like he can relate to a lot of his potential clients and audience and customers which is again the point and something that if you're trying to sell courses and one-on-one -on -one coaching to people for the price of $249.99 for one-on-one -on -one coaching for 30 minutes or his apparently most popular three sessions for $5.99 or his VIP $1,000 one-on-one coaching for 45 to 60 minutes, you want to be able to relate to your potential customers. You want to make it sound as if you came from nothing. And he very well most likely did. And what he has achieved is aspirational if it is what it seems to portray on social media. I also do just wanna take a second to go over his LinkedIn because he did mention that he has advanced degrees. And for what I've seen on his LinkedIn, his advanced degrees don't necessarily coincide with any type of financial education. He went to Michigan State University and studied psychology. He then went on to study cognitive behavioral therapy. I see a lot of value in mental health work and psychology and psychiatry and things like that. I do think it's important. <sighs> some of you are gonna hate me for saying this. I think sometimes certain people can use their knowledge about the human brain to their own advantage and use it in order to manipulate and generate sales. And I'm not at all saying that's what Chris is doing. However, I think it's worth acknowledging that he does have cognitive behavioral therapy training and psychology background. And that could potentially help him with his one-on-one -on -one coaching, his sales. He may be great at trading. He may be really knowledgeable with that. But he's also very knowledgeable on gaining a following, getting people in, understanding human psychology and what makes people motivated and what makes them want to follow someone. I do think that his coaching, his successful YouTube channel, his successful social media following is where some of his income maybe a large amount of his income is coming from. He also claims he is retired. Again, that sounds all well and good. It sounds great to claim that you're retired. It sounds inspirational, but he's working technically. I, I don't understand this whole, I get it. I guess I get it, but I don't. Like it sounds great and it sounds inspirational to tell people that you're retired, but he's not retired. He works very hard from what I've seen, just from his daily YouTube videos. That, that does take some work and that's just one element of his business. So I do feel the need to acknowledge that as well. And going back to his costs, going back to his price breakdowns of just how much he charges for his one-on-one -on -one coaching services. He's charging a lot and essentially he may be making a lot of money off the stock market, but I think he's also making a lot of money off of his audience. I'm gonna fully admit that I didn't do a lot of digging on this. Like I said, he updates and he posts a video every single day. However, people on Reddit, people online do mention that he doesn't necessarily show his own personal live trades very often or what he's made or what he's lost. You can look under Chris Sane or any other finance bros YouTube channel or Instagram and you will see you know, dozens and dozens of comments, glowing reviews, support and love, and just an outpour of appreciation for these finance bros and what they're teaching people and what they're offering people. It's interesting because you can then turn to other areas and other places on the internet like subreddits and you will see communities of thousands of people who have essentially been burnt by finance bros. Chris Sane himself has a subreddit of like 3,000 people talking about him on Reddit. And this is where I think it's important to acknowledge that finance bros, finfluencers are no different to regular influencers in the sense that they too are involved in parasocial relationships. But I almost think to a little bit more of a dangerous degree and much like it does with lifestyle influencers when people fall further and further into these strong bonds and these strong parasocial relationships with lifestyle influencers who maybe open up about their struggles or share a lipstick or a product recommendation or feel like they're your best friend sometimes. I think the parasocial relationship that can be formed with finance bros or finance influencers can be so much stronger, especially when they help you make money or they're teaching you something about your finances and it's going well and you're making money off their advice. You might hang on every word they say until they mess up or until they make a mistake or until you make a wrong trade or you slip up somewhere. And that could cost you thousands. That's why I think a lot of these subreddits exist. It's people who have potentially been burnt by these finance bros. It's also alleged on a lot of these finance bro 
subreddits that a lot of these daily uploaders on YouTube will delete a video if a stock plummeted or if some of their advice ended up backfiring. Apparently a lot of them won't actually come out and admit that they made a mistake or admit that they led people wrong or even just simply apologize. I suppose if you apologize you then in some ways admit guilt which that's the last thing you want to do especially if you're operating a financial services business without actual proper licenses which a lot of them I don't think have and a lot of them are really towing that line of what's legal and what's not. A lot of them will have that same warning, that same disclaimer at the start of their videos or their posts or in their caption, but really they're coming online and saying this trade's going to do really well, buy in at this price and then sell at this price. They're giving financial advice, like they're, they're telling people what to do and it's actually amazing that so many of them are able to get away with it. I now want to take a moment to talk about the brand deals and sponsorships that finance bros can find themselves involved in or enticed by. Because again, I think these are and can be a lot more dangerous than say, your everyday lifestyle influencers sponsorships. You're listening to a, an influencer being sponsored by like a makeup company or talking about, I don't know, like freaking a blanket or something. And say that company goes bankrupt or goes out of business, you still got the blanket to hold on to, you still have the lipstick. It's very different in a lot of cases that finance bros can end up promoting something that turns really, really bad and costs their audience thousands. And this has happened on numerous occasions. If influencers, just like any other influencer, can be bought. They can be bought by companies and enticed with five or six figure brand deals that backfire. This one particular article came out July of this year and it's surrounding a group of influencers ex-reality TV stars from shows like Love Island and Geordie Shore, they actually pleaded not guilty to promoting an unauthorized investment scheme on Instagram and they're actually going to be tried in 2027. The charges were put forward by the Financial Conduct Authority at an earlier hearing in July, which was previously claimed the stars had promoted the scheme allegedly run by Emmanuel Nuanzi. The FCA alleges that Nuanzi used the Instagram account Holly FX Trends alongside Holly Thompson to advise on buying and selling contracts for different CFDs when they were not authorized to do so between the years 2018 to 2021. The CFDs, the FCA says, were high risk investments that saw 80% of customers lose money. Each defendant is charged with one count of issuing unauthorized communications of financial promotions. Nuanzi has also pleaded not guilty to running an unauthorized investment scheme. Should they be convicted, they're going to be facing up to two years in prison. We're not even talking about finance bros at this portion. We're talking about everyday influencers, ex-reality stars. Okay, look, I admitted at the start of the video, I don't think I'm very financially literate. I do not feel at all educated, as educated as I could be with finances and with money. I would not touch a sponsorship like this with a 10 foot pole. It happens a lot more than we think. A lot of influencers used to promote BlockFi and FTX. So FTX was actually a cryptocurrency exchange and it had over 1 million users at its peak in July, 2021. As of November, 2022, FTX was the third largest digital currency exchange and it had a valuation of $32 billion and an active trading volume of 10 billion. An article that came out in May of this year says that nearly all 98% of customers of FTX will get their money back, okay, plus interest rates after the cryptocurrency exchange imploded 17 months ago. To know that most customers of FTX are getting their money back, that's great to hear. However, to know that it took like, and is probably also still ongoing, 17 months is a long time to be waiting for your money back. And to know that a lot of these finance bros were heavily sponsored, heavily, we're talking five, six figure brand deals on the regular to promote these particular companies. They had a hand in this. 
and then it just imploded. BlockFi is another one that a lot of finance bros were sponsored to promote and even still to this day, you can go to some of these Finfluencers YouTube channels and you can still see in their descriptions, they still have their affiliate codes, they still have their links to BlockFi in their description. Some of them even still have videos up about BlockFi. Some of them who were heavily sponsored, regularly sponsored by BlockFi, did not even come out with any type of acknowledgement, any type of apology. They just kind of wiped their hands clean, slipped it under the rug and just wanted to pretend that none of that happened. A lot of their audience took issue with a lot of finance bros at this time. BlockFi and the issues surrounding people's refunds is still to this day ongoing. Somewhat recently they came out and said that people would be getting 100% of their money back. Good news for BlockFi customers, y'all are gonna get 100% of your claim. However, a lot of people are pissed because it's not technically the case and a lot of people aren't actually getting back their money, so to speak. Like I said in the beginning, okay, I am not, I am not an expert. I am not a finance bro. I'm going to let Bennett explain it a lot better than I can. So the reason that people are getting 100% is this $874.5 million claim against FTX that was monetized. So now people can be repaid. But it's important to remember here, BlockFi filed for bankruptcy on November 28th, 2022. Right here, November 28th, Bitcoin was $16,222. Now, I don't know the exact price they locked in for the bankruptcy, but uh, it's going to be around $16,000 or so. So very, very bottom of the market. So that basically means, as a lot of you guys know, let's say you had 10 Bitcoin on BlockFi. So that means your claim would be 10 times whatever they locked in the price for Bitcoin, maybe $170,000. That means that you're going to be getting back $170,000, which right now is less than three Bitcoin. So this applies to FTX, Celsius, Voyager, BlockFi. The whole idea is the same. You're getting a percent in BlockFi's case, 100% of your claim based on the day that they filed bankruptcy, how much all of the cryptocurrencies you held were worth. The subscriber base of a lot of these Finfluencers turned on these men because they felt as if either the lack of acknowledgement or even some of the ones that did come out with an apology, they felt like it was so disingenuous, especially considering, you know, they were making hundreds of thousands of dollars. Like I said, $50,000 for monthly brand deals. And the best that they could do was just say, sorry, oopsie, messed up. When their fans, their subscribers lost thousands of dollars. A lot of subscribers felt like these influences, these finfluencers weren't doing enough. CoffeeZilla actually did a whole video about this. I'm gonna have it linked if you wanna check it out or if you haven't already. It's a really great analysis of the whole thing. The guy you see next to me is the most generous billionaire in the world. And I found him. <gasps> The most generous billionaire ever where you can get 10% off on your trading fees. These are bad. These are very bad. But FTX, there are no fees whatsoever. And if you sign up with our link, signing up using my link, there are referral links. If you use my link below and the code name Tom Nash. Oh, stop it, please. You guys are embarrassing yourselves. Countless celebrities have also been caught promoting undisclosed ads. In 2021, at the height of the cryptocurrency craze, none other than Kim Kardashian posted an Instagram story promoting a brand new token. And at the time she actually agreed to pay a whopping $1.26 million fine for advertising. The US Securities and Exchange Commission said the reality TV star had received $250,000 for advertising the cryptocurrency without actually disclosing that she had been paid to do so. I think the problem is a lot of these finance bros, they make it sound so easy. And when something goes wrong, which it does and which it has, people are left scrambling because they don't have the proper education. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what to do. Their favorite influencer, the person they were hanging on every word and taking their advice from is looking out for number one. The next point that I take issue with is the major difference in wealth and income between these finance bros and the audience that actually built them up to that point. Like I mentioned, a lot of these finance bros, sure, they may make money from investments, from trading, various other things, but a lot of their money is also made from their sponsorships and off their audience. Like I mentioned, $50,000, $60,000 monthly sponsorships. And a lot of the time, they almost become so wealthy that they become out of touch 
with the people that got them there. I mean, it's one banana, Michael. What could it cost? $10? To me, nothing feels clearer regarding this point than listening to Kevin on this semi-recent podcast. I'm going to share a few excerpts from it. I will have it linked in its entirety if you want to check it out. Listening to this Kevin person, I just got such a creepy, disingenuous vibe listening to him. And I want to share some of the excerpts from this podcast that made me feel the way I do. Before we get into it, I do want to say he is incredibly successful. It's being alleged online that he has a net worth of approximately $50 million. I'm not sure how accurate that is, but I do believe that a lot of his success is actually thanks to his YouTube career and what his audience has been able to provide for him. He has this array of online courses and if it wasn't for his social media following, who would be buying these? Like, who, who, but honestly, who is buying these? Okay, one of my favorite things. I did a whole video about the dark world of luxury life coaches. This is just a whole nother world of the same thing. Like this one right here, for instance. Most popular, Stocks and the Psychology of Money. You can access this course for $2,315. You can get the Diamond Lifetime membership to his courses for $19,980. Ew. I don't realize the people that I offend because I just, I don't take the time to think about it because I'm like, oh, next video. <laughs> now this is slightly out of context, but I do still feel like it's important to acknowledge. You can chase down this podcast. You can listen to it in entirety. It's like over two hours. So have fun with that if you want to listen to it. But I just want to take a moment to say that exactly what he said. He doesn't take the time to think about who he's offended or even potentially who is hurt. It's just on to the next video. And I think in a lot of cases with these Finfluencers, these finance bros, content is key. Content is number one. The clickbaity titles, the outlandish statements. The more eyes that they can get on their videos, the better. And they may be saying some really outlandish, wild, crazy things in regards to financial advice but they don't take a second to think how that could potentially harm someone or hurt someone or lead someone astray. It's just on to the next. And I think that's a big problem. Again, he's not necessarily talking about that, but that's kind of what I took from that as well is it applies to his audience. He admits he doesn't take the time to think how his videos or how his content or how whatever he does could possibly offend people. But I also don't think he stops and takes a second to think how it could hurt people. Is that when people see you buying in your, I believe it's a Weeble account, right? Mm -hmm. Is that the, yeah. and they see like $2 million in the account yeah. and they see you buying like a hundred grand into a stock. <laughs> yeah. For some people, that is like their entire net worth. Yes. And they see you putting a hundred grand and they, and they don't see it in context where that yes. hundred grand for you, if it goes to zero. It doesn't matter. It's, just, it's yeah. just like someone putting a grand in a stock and just like, oh, just see what happens. I know. So I think, People sometimes see those numbers and they yeah. see, wow, he just made 50 grand on his play of whatever it is, a call option on, let, let's say, Tesla. He put 100 grand in that and made mm. 50 really quickly. And I think people see that. It screws in their mind and thinking, oh, man, if you put 100 in, I'm going to put a, you know, half of my net worth in this. Ugh, and yeah. it, it screws the right. perception. And I actually really agree with this. Again, I've been shitting on finance bros for like, what? over half an hour at this point probably but i also think it is worth acknowledging that the audience also has a part to play in this and they're not completely innocent you know everybody is able to make decisions regarding their own actions and personal responsibility is also important and should be acknowledged and i think sometimes again this parasocial relationship comes into play and people look up to these influences and they think oh well so and so put this much in I'm going to put, I'm going to match that or I'm going to extend past what is probably safe and responsible for me to invest. And I think sometimes personal responsibility does need to be taken into consideration. I tend to think it's a bit of the economy right now is in such a K-shaped recovery where yeah. some people are doing really well and yep. other people are not. That's a good point. And I thought about that. that there's a lot of resentment that's built up. I just want to take a moment to really acknowledge just again to prove my point. It's obviously within a larger conversation, but I do feel like it's really important. They're talking about the economy and how some people are doing really well and some people aren't doing very well. And he literally says, <laughs> let me just go back for a second. That's a good point. And I thought about that. That's a good point. I never thought about that. You never thought about how the economy and people's 
personal financial situations some people are really benefiting but a large number of people are suffering and having a really hard time keeping up and staying afloat he literally says that's a good point i never even thought about that see what i mean not very bright and these are the people that some take their financial advice from a man who literally admits that he didn't even think about the state of the economy and how some are doing really well and some not. These people are so wealthy off the backs of their subscribers and now so unrelatable and so out of touch that they don't even take a second to think about... <laughs> what? I just want to take a moment to listen to what he has to say about inflation. If, I rem if I'm understanding your question correctly, you're asking why, why are things still getting more expensive right yes. now? I mean, they're really not. If you look at TVs, for example, well, when I bought my first TV, it was a 40-inch TV for $2,000. Now I can get that for $199. TVs is like, that's like the one example. No, but it's anything. It's phones. It's computers. I think I think groceries would be one. Like the cost mm -hmm. of food is going yeah. up. The cost of utilities it are going go up. It did go up. It's now going down. But it already went up like it did. 30%. It, did. So it went down a few yeah. percent. No, no, no. But, but what, we're, what you're referring to is... Um, the inflation of COVID, right? The the we have a we have a crisis. Oh my gosh, we want to avoid a recession, so we're going to print nine trillion dollars or whatever. I maybe I'm just stupid. Maybe I'm genuinely stupid. Like I mentioned in the beginning, I believe I'm not at all financially literate. But this man is literally talking about how TVs are cheaper and toasters and electronics and phones and whatnot. But again, we're not buying TVs and phones and toasters on the daily. I actually follow the other men's train of thought more and get groceries. That's what people are buying every day that we are seeing a huge increase on and inflation. And this is suffocating for a lot of people. And he doesn't, I don't think he understands that. I actually don't feel like he really understands that. He's just seeing it as, oh, like things are so much cheaper than they used to be and then rattles off a bunch of appliances. I don't I I don't understand honestly. It's just it actually baffling to me. But again, like I said, not at all a finance bro. If you're poor in America oh with gosh. no disabilities, no dependents, anything out of the ordinary between the ages of let's say 25 and 55. Mm -hmm. Is it your fault? If you're not making money or you're poor? Yeah. Oh, of course it is. 100%. It's absolutely your fault. If you're not making more than six figures and you don't have disabilities and you're 25 plus years old, the, the, usually the problem though is, is, is the mindset. People start with, well, I'm 25 and I'm not making six figures. Kevin says I'm entitled to make six figures. No, I'm not saying that. So people get this idea of that, okay, well, I'm a loser because I'm not making six figures. No, that's not true. You haven't figured out how to provide value to society yet. Once you figure out how to provide value to society, you will be paid a lot more than six figures. Like I said, you can go pursue this in its entirety. I just don't like this guy, okay? I just don't. This is, again, a theme that I could literally make a whole video on. He brought this up more than once, this idea that if you are over 25 and don't have any type of disability, you should be able to make six figures. And if you don't, it's because you haven't found your thing yet or you're lazy or you're not trying hard enough. And then he goes on to talk about purpose and finding something that society values. And I, there is so much that I could say here and it still won't be enough, but I know people who make less than 100K and I know people who make more than 100K. And this whole idea that if you, if you make less than 100K, and again, Australia is different to the States and, and wherever you're from personally, but I think, for example, the example of teachers. I know of people who are teachers and they don't make 100K. Is that meaning that what they do is not valuable to society and that they're not trying hard enough and that they haven't found something of value? He then rattles on about uh, like finding a professional career, like a being a pilot or how you can be a plumber and make six figures and just all of... It's it, just the way that he so simply talks about how easy it is, how it's just, it's so easy and it, it should be and it just work hard, try harder. You're not trying hard enough. This mentality, and I, I've seen it before. This one here is a perfect example. It's just this exact mentality just on steroids, basically. I could touch on Grant Cardone, but honestly, I could do a whole deep dive on this man. But just this, this is just to me, I find it so disgusting. It makes me want to vomit in my mouth. I don't know how you guys could even live on that number. If I made 400 grand a year, I would be embarrassed with myself as a husband, a father, basically as a human being. 
born a grant. How do you make sense of $35,000 a month? You have not done the math because you cannot live on 400 grand a year. Anybody can make 400 grand a year. All you got to do is show up. Anyone can make 400 grand a year. You just got to show up. So in case you're wondering if you're not on 400 grand a year, it's because you're not showing up. Okay. It's because we're not, we're not showing up. We're not. I can't stand lazy people. Stop being lazy. I'm going a bit off topic here. We've got to get back to the other podcast. But again, this is a strategy. This is a tactic they use. First of all, these people are so unrelatable and so out of touch. If you're not making more than $400,000 a year, you're disgusting, embarrassing. You should be ashamed of yourself. This is a tactic. It's a it's a tactic to sell. It's a tactic to get people hooked. They either use inspiration and aspiration as a tool, or they use shame and they try to belittle you and embarrass you and make you feel stupid and make it feel like they know something to then go ahead and buy their ridiculously overpriced courses. It disgusts me. There is one particular point that he talks about relatability, and I just wanna I wanna end this particular portion on, on this. Do you worry about being unrelatable now? I I mean, have you given up on that? I've totally given up on that. First of all, I've never been relatable. I was bullied I as a child. I feel like you have. I yeah, been, yeah. In, the, in the early days, like I'm talking like 2017 YouTube, 2018 YouTube. I feel like you were really relatable. I think I, everyone mm. in the finance space to a certain degree was. I, uh, yeah, see, I, I guess I just never felt that way because like I'm jumping out of bushes, I'm doing like stupid pranks and like stupid, like, uh, and uh, having these weird perspectives. Uh, I, I always thought that was unrelatable. I always thought my marketing real estate was so unique that it was unrelatable. People were like, oh, you put your face in your car. Oh my God. You like the way I market it or whatever. Oh, no pressure agent. Oh, you're weird. Uh, didn't want to work for a broker when I was a kid. I was bullied because everything I did was different. Uh, I've <clears throat> always been of this this like weirdo kind of uh, people has, have cast me out as a weirdo. So I've never really tried to fit in. Again, there's so much I could say here, but he's, he's trying to correlate being a weirdo and jumping out of bushes with, with not being relatable. I believe that the problem here is again, out of touch influencers who have just obscene amounts of wealth that they can no longer relate to the audience that built them and they constantly are just belittling them and saying st stupid shit. like if you don't make 100k or 400k a year you're not showing up and whatever else i believe that you can actually be wealthy and still a good person and relatable that's actually a combination that i believe can exist but again, he's literally doesn't even really understand that because he's so far gone. In his mind, he believes that, well, I'm not relatable now because I've never been relatable. I've always been a weirdo. I've always been a weirdo and I jump out of bushes. This video has gone on way too long. My brain feels fried. How did we get here? How do we get out? You're not relatable because of you built your wealth off of your audience and you can no longer even acknowledge how the average person, how your followers even live anymore. Like you're so out of touch and you just believe that it's because you're quirky and like you're a weirdo, like that's why you're not relatable. No, you're unrelatable because you genuinely don't think about the economy and how it affects people. You don't think about inflation and you believe things like mobile phones and TVs and things are cheaper than they've ever been, but like don't take a second to consider the price of groceries. You think that everybody should be able to make, or you know, if you're not making over 100K, you haven't found something of value to add to the world yet. That is why I believe this man is unrelatable to me. I do not relate to this man. I do not understand this man. I don't see this man as someone to look up to or I don't feel any sincerity when I listen to this man. But again, different strokes for different folks. I'm sure people probably love him and adore him. Me personally, two hours of him on this little podcast was enough for me. At the end of the day, I believe Finfluencers Finance Bros, like I said, are influencers first. They're entertainers first. That is what they are. Well before they are financial advisors even if they are at all. Like I would not take financial advice from any of these people personally. And a lot of what they say and show is just glitz and glamour to disillusion or even just to confuse their audience. Like I'm actually deeply embarrassed to admit how many times, like I said, I'm clearly potentially just not smart enough, but I had to watch this like four times.
So you spent $150,000 on this Porsche. Why are you wasting your money like that? Remember, I'm not paying for the car. And also because of section 179 plus bonus depreciation allows me to write the entire car off in year one. Okay, what do you mean that you're not paying for it? Oh, where's this money coming from? Because I intend to use it 100% for one of my businesses, I'm gonna be using it as a tax write-off. So I get $55,000 in taxes I'm gonna be saving. And plus I just recently bought an asset. It's an Airbnb property that's paying for the entire car. But you're still paying for it though, right? When I say I'm not paying for it, I'm not actively working for that income. So I have a team in place and the Airbnb pays for all my staff as well. I only work about 30 minutes to an hour per week just to manage everything. And that asset pays for the car. Okay. So you're saying that you're saving $55,000 in taxes and you have an asset paying for this car. Where can people learn more about this type of stuff? Just give me a follow at the Legacy Investing Show. I had to, like I said, I had to watch that four or five times and I still am like, what? What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? It's all like... Again, what is he trying to plug? His like, follow him, like him, follow his course. Most people can't even afford whatever sports car that is, let alone an Airbnb. And the way he just so casually talks about it as if it's so simple and ends the two minute video with like my page, follow for more, leading you on to just be so mesmerized by all of his assets and everything he's able to achieve. And the fact that it, what did he say, only works half an hour, an hour or whatever. It's the way in which they hook people in. They are salesmen at the end of the day. They are entertainers who bring you into their world and they make their living off of the everyday person who is enticed by what they're trying to sell. I would love to hear your thoughts on today's video. I'd love to hear your thoughts on any influencers that you turn to for financial advice. Maybe throw some names my way. Who knows, I might learn a thing or two. Do you believe that you're as financially educated as you can be? because I admitted that I certainly am not. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below. I'm gonna have another few links for you there if you wanna check those out. Thank you so much for joining me in today's video. And my brain is so fried. I will see you in my next one. Bye.